Welcome to the Golf and Fitness Show, brought to you by PGA Tour Active. I'm your host, Corey Gregory. I'm just going to say it now. All of our listeners should be able to drive the ball at least 20 yards further after this show today. I'm so excited because we have two special guests. We have a rising star on the long drive circuit who has three top 10 finishes since the start of her career in 2019, Cassandra Meyer. And we also have two-time world long drive champion who stands six foot six, 230 pounds, <laughs> Mr. Tim Burke. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thanks. For Thank you. Me. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. So listen, I saw Bryson post yesterday. We're talking Arnold Palmer Invitational presented by MasterCard. Got to make sure I drop that. Uh, you know, he's trying to go across the pond. It's a 555 yard par five. I've seen some video, Tim, of you attempting it. Now, I don't know if you've made it off video. I didn't see a video confirming it, but your thoughts on Bryson trying it kind of your thoughts on that in general. And uh, I just, I just think it's good because it's a current thing that people are going to be talking about. So hearing your take on this shot would be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I think he, he definitely has the speed to do it. If the conditions and the wind is like down, especially if it's down off the right. Mm -hmm. um, I have done, I've actually made two there twice. And Ooh. Arnie, Arnie was there for one of them, which was cool. Dude, that, um, that's like amazing, right? <laughs> Yeah, one I hold out from the back bunker. Another one was a long putt. Wow. But, uh, yeah, I was texting him uh, yesterday, actually, and we were talking about it. And I was just trying to see what he was going to do because I always aim basically at the green to make sure I hit, like, miss right, like hit a push or a cut. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you accidentally pull it, and then you're just kind of crossing your fingers. But the wow. funny thing about that hole is the, the longest carry, it's not straight at the green. So if you bail right, it's actually longer how the water's cut out. Gotcha. Tell So – First off, the fact that Arnold was there for one of them, like lead me through that real quick. Like everyone wants to know, like, how did that feel? What was his reaction? Um, that had to be awesome. Um, so he was there for the tee shot. He used to drive around. This was years ago. Yeah. He used to just kind of drive around and say hi to all the members and everything. And we were playing in a group with a, with a bunch of his buddies. And, um, and then he saw me hit the shot and he was, obviously couldn't see it. A lot of people can't. And there's yeah. just like, you know, asking me about my shaft. Is it really whippy? Is it stiff? <laughs> he, he thought it would be like really whippy, which was, was obviously the opposite. It's pretty, yeah. pretty stout. Um, yeah. So that, that was pretty cool. It was just coincidence that he was driving around for that tee shot. A uh, pretty awesome coincidence. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cassandra, we were talking before we got on that your best drive in competition, you said was what again? 300 and I think it was 324. 324 and tim i read that yours is 400 and something ridiculous what is it yeah 474 that was uh <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> yeah that was uh to win in arizona in 2019 our last like uh like series and when we had the whole season and everything the tour event out there in auction that's uh, it's unbelievable so when you guys go to let's call it a normal course it's like absurd, right? I mean, it would have to be. I know that you don't hit everyone right down the middle, but you guys have to keep it in the line. So I would think that your accuracy obviously is, is pretty good when you're playing a normal round of golf. Is it like just straight driver wedge, which everyone wants to be that way, but it sounds like that's how you guys got to be most of the time at that at this point. I'm not. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not like that long for long driver if that's what you want to call me i mean my entire passing golf is is traditional golf so yeah you know, when i'm out trying to play around i was always long on tour but you know not quite like long drive long so yeah especially when i pick up my plane driver and i'm just trying to like smooth it i got gotcha. you most of the time i'll just hit three wood anyways and um so yeah i mean the, the course is a little bit shorter for me just because i am somewhat long uh you know from like an even an lpga standard but mm -hmm. It's not quite like Tim's standard of dwarfing courses. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, for me, uh, it kind of depends on the approach. So if I'm trying to score, I hit a lot of two irons off the tee, which obviously being longer, you know, I, I'm, I hit the fairway the majority of the time with that club. Sure. Um, so that gives me the opportunity to still have shorter irons mm -hmm. into the greens. But, yeah, if the hole sets up right, I'll just send it. For sure, if I know Love. which way I can miss. <laughs> and Tim's a much better golfer than I think 
most people would give him credit for. Like he he's a legitimate golfer. Like he can yeah. put up scores. Thanks. Well, yeah, I think I'm the only hack that's actually on the microphone currently. So I would say, I mean, at the end of the day, is there that that's a just a random question that popped in my head. Is there a, a weird lack of respect because you guys have specialized in one area from other tour players, or do you not is that not really a thing? I literally have no clue. I don't think from tour players, um, I mean, you know, I only played one season on long drive, so although I've kind of at least on social media and stuff, I think I've created a little bit of a name for myself being mm -hmm. in the drive world. Um, I think that like most people still know that I play golf and obviously I'm, I'm not like incredibly long. So, um, but for a lot of the long drivers, I think there is sort of this stigma, like, oh, you can hit it that far, but you obviously can't putt or you don't have any feel with your wedges or, you know, what would you actually shoot on the golf course, which there are a couple of guys that probably don't play any regular golf, but sure good amount of them especially like the the guys that win quite often I mean you have like Kyle and Justin and I mean, a lot of the other guys that um can legitimately put up scores so mm -hmm. and a lot of the females as well a lot of the women are like legitimately good golfers and have played competitive golf in their past so um I think it's it's a little bit of a stigma out there <clears throat> but um I don't think like necessarily with tour players maybe just more with like fans or I gotcha know, golfers yeah and, just kind of general I, yeah. yeah. I wondered if there was like, it's almost like in my world, right? The power lifter versus the, uh, I guess the technician bodybuilder that doesn't, you know, go for the heaviest weight all the time. Like, it's like that same kind of thing. That's always like kind of there. I just wondered, I thought that was, I thought that was interesting, but I would think that Tim, when you've played obviously with multiple guys on tour, I'm sure they're, you know, you guys are like comparing notes, right? At times I, I would think. Yeah, I mean, I've helped out a few people that are trying to make it on the tour recently, just trying to gain a little more distance and stuff. But mm -hmm. I kind of look at it like those guys have so many years ahead of me from, from mm -hmm. the short game. You know, they've been swinging a golf club since they could walk. Yeah. So, yeah, the short game is like a whole other animal inside 100 yards. Like for me, I, I get so long. And sometimes on those shorter shots, I need to make sure I'm taking it back like halfway and then getting to a full finish. And mm -hmm. what I think is halfway sometimes is like <laughs> almost well, to the top. So yeah. you, know, you got to get rid of some of these hands sometimes. I think your halfway for your swing probably is, <laughs> it, you know what I'm saying? Because of, of how much um, turn you have to get for the long drive stuff, probably your halfway and everyone else's halfway is two different things. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, we got the players championship coming up and, you know, statistically it's the strongest field usually even over some of the the majors that's what the pga actually confirmed with me before i got on so who's your guys's pick um you know with a stacked field coming up next week uh, for me i'm gonna go with rory i mean love it he put on a show there the last time i was out there watching so i was really impressed with him i always am so i'm, I'm definitely gonna take rory cassandra I just, I pick Tony, you know, for everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do, you know, he's guaranteed to be up there in the running and. He's a beast. For it, yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to podcasting with him. He seems like a cool guy. <laughs> yeah. Tony seems like a super cool dude. I, I, I'm excited to podcast with him at some point. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's awesome. The whole family is really awesome. So. All right. So I want, we got to get some tips for the fans here. So Tim, I'm going to start with you. What's some of the pitfalls that people fall into when they're trying to get more distance like what's things you see from you know weekend warrior general hacks um all the way up to even some you know really good uh high level players like what's a couple of the pitfalls that you can help you know with your advice so they don't do this so they can get more distance yeah i would say for like the the weekend warrior hack however you, <laughs> you just put that um a lot of them like the the harder they try to swing or the faster they swing, they just get really tense. Mm -hmm. And obviously the body's not going to move as fluid. So they actually start swinging slower. And then they also forget the most important thing is to hit the center of the club face. Mm -hmm. So just because you're swinging faster, you need to be able to deliver it correctly at the same time. And then as far as like for the professionals that I see sometimes, it's just something as small as not using their legs as much as they should, like loading it. If they're a right-handed golfer, loading into that right side and making sure that they kind of, have a small squat and get up and through it left through the golf ball at delivery. Yeah. That's, those are the two things. What's some of the things you see, Cassandra? 
Yeah, I mean, he kind of touched on that a little bit, but I would say that, like, the biggest thing for the average golfer that I see is just they try to create speed with their arms and their hands where, you know, your power is really coming from, like, your big muscles, your lower body, your core, and, you know, arms and the hands are just following. So, like, for me, I had to learn how to use the ground a little bit more. And, and so when you tell someone to swing fast, you can just see them trying to, like, muscle it with their, with their arms, and that's just not how, how it's going to happen. What about the death grip, death grip on the club? Like, that's the one thing I see like you, cause I, I play golf with a lot of guys that lift weights. And so they get up there and it looks like they're trying to strangle this golf club. And then, yeah, they end up swinging slower. So is that one of the things people do too much or, or is that not when you're hitting the thing 475, are you gripping the crap out of that thing, Tim, or what's up? No, I try to barely hold it, kind of hold it like a gentle bird, if you will. Hey, okay. Okay. But I'm sure like at impact, like if you see pictures, like, you know, it looks like I'm holding it pretty tight, but that's through impact. But I try to, I try to be very fluid. Okay. I try to be really relaxed. Is there, Cassandra, is there any like, I can't uh, about the grip because I get yelled at for that all the time. <laughs> why? Why do you get yelled at for it? Gripping because it too hard. Grip the club. <laughs> Death grip the club. Like, why are the veins popping in your forearms? Like, just <laughs> fill out a little bit on that club. <laughs> That's a great statement. Why are the veins popping out of your forearms? I can identify with that. I love it. <laughs> what's uh what's a weekly training regimen? Tim, we'll start with you. Kind of look like how do you schedule out um or even stage some of your training from power stuff or rotation stuff? Like kind of give us like a a rough estimate on how many days a week, kind of how you uh, set up your programming. Yeah, usually it's four days a week. Okay. Um, I'd say Monday and Thursday is usually like powerful lifting days, cleans. A lot of jumps, sprints, and stuff like that. Okay. Tuesdays, Fridays would typically be more rotational power and speed days. Mm -hmm. And then Wednesdays usually just kind of active rest and then the weekend's recovery. So when you say power days, are you going like a conjugate method where you're rotating maxes? Are you doing percentage work? Like what's kind of your, the way that you train? It kind of depends on the time of the year and what we're trying to peak for. Okay. So, I mean, I don't. I usually never like max out. Mm -hmm. Um, The heaviest I'll get to, I guess, would be like like five sets of four. Like for instance, like a X bar deadlift type thing. So I mean, Mm -hmm. it's pretty pretty heavy, but uh, nothing too crazy because might be like between eighty ninety percent roughly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that makes sense. How about you, Cassandra? How do you set up your training during the week? Um, It's pretty similar to Tim's. uh, Not quite so uh, scheduled because I'm usually doing everything on my own, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similar. I try to balance between, you know, getting stronger and, and lifting heavy um, and then just making sure that I'm still able to move what I have properly. So, you know, just doing, I do a lot of plyo, um, not a lot of like straight up cardio, just um, more explosive training. Sure. Um, so just a nice little combination of that. Um, and then, you know, also I don't really max out a whole lot because I don't have someone spotting me all the time, but mm-hmm. um, just kind of a nice little balance between yeah, just getting stronger and then, and then staying faster, a lot of sprints and box jumps and stuff like that. So one of the things I always share with my guest, uh, sorry, I'm, I was saying one of the things I always uh, share with my guest and actually Scott Stallings tried it for 30 days when I, when I hipped him to it, but I lunge 800 meters a day after my lifting workouts. So that's my conditioning. Yeah, exactly. Now he did 400, but when he was in, he had a little bit of a break in between events and he did a 30 day, uh, 400 meters after his main lifts. And he, and he said that, um, obviously you're sore for the first week, but once your body adapts that it's amazing how you can rip off a 400 meter lunge, knee touch quality form, you know, eight to 10 minutes and then not be sore the next day. So it creates, you know, a physical preparedness. That's, that's pretty cool. So not that you have to do it, but I just want to throw it out there. If you guys are looking for something different and you have a little bit of off time, the 400 meter lunges post lifting is very interesting for your guys' sport. Actually, every athlete, NFL, MLB, doesn't matter, especially pitchers, anybody that has a lot of glute, hip rotation, hamstring work, which is about everything, uh, has has benefited from it. So that's my favorite thing. What I want to ask you guys is, Tim, like, what's your favorite top two exercises that you have to do weekly because you know that it contributes, you know, to the success that you've had? Um, definitely deadlift. Just okay. because that's probably the best thing. I'm, I'm like, I'm great at that for compared to the other things. For six foot but, six, that's good, dude. <laughs> yeah, I don't get under the the bench much. I you know, I'm yeah. embarrassed there. Um, yeah, I would say deadlift, and then I always like I even do them every day. Sometimes it's just heavy kettlebell swings, explosive. 
triple extension, getting your hips going. That makes Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. Yeah. That just gets everything firing. I like doing that heavy before, before I, like a day or two before I compete. I like that. Cassandra, what's your top two? Um, I'm very odd dominant. So when I started long drive, I had to kind of relearn how to use my posterior chain because mm-hmm. I, I realized that I like don't know how to properly fire it. Um, just because like, I think I re- relied on my quads for everything that's supposed to be, you know, sure. hamstrings. So, um, heavy hip thrusts were really, really good for me. Okay. Um, and then like a 180 box jump. I love, I just feel like if I do uh, that and then I go straight to hitting golf balls, I feel faster. So when you say 180 box jump, explain what that is to the fans. Like you're facing the opposite direction and you're jumping while rotating. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I saw Joey D doing a bunch of that stuff with his with mm-hmm. his players down there. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Tim, yeah, what's the what, what's the nutrition look like for you? Um, you know, obviously you guys are peaking for certain events, but on a regular basis, um, do you follow some super strict macro thing? Do you have just kind of certain meals that you enjoy? What's uh or like, you know, I talked to when I talked to Bernhard Langer, he was like yeah, I just eat kind of when I'm hungry and try not to eat too much sugar. It wasn't like nothing <laughs> right. too crazy. You know what I mean? So what, what's kind of your approach? That's kind of how I am. Um, sometimes I'll get, you know, more intense about it, depending on the time of the year where I'll have like pre uh, made meals and stuff delivered to the house through somebody at the gym. But, sure. um, but usually I just try to eat clean, a lot of mm-hmm. protein and just try to eat clean. I could always be better at it, to be honest. I think we all could, right? <laughs> that's, that's part of it, right? Cassandra, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a diet person at all. I think that, you know, you have to be able to do something consistently and stick with it for a long period of time for it to be successful. Lifestyle. Yeah. Um, so I heard someone say recently, like, they don't adopt new, like, nutritional or fitness goals that they don't see themselves being able to do in the next year. And I was like, that's really smart. You know, like, if you don't plan mm-hmm. on doing it a year from now, it's probably not going to be that successful for you. So... Um, I just grew up in a super like healthy family and, you know, I read the ingredients and trying to try to stay away from everything artificial. And, um, so, you know, just clean eating I cook a lot. I love cooking. So it's meat and veggies. And I was a vegetarian for like 14 years. So I have kind of like dabbled oh, wow. in other stuff as well, but I eat a lot of meat now. Oh, and- I didn't know that. That's a long time, Cassandra, to yeah. be a vegetarian. Yeah. <laughs> what may- well, I got to ask this question. What was this? Why was the switch? I just like I moved out of my house. My mom was a vegetarian for a long time, so I just kind of like grew up that way. And then um, when I moved out and I was cooking for other people, I was like, it's just a pain in the butt to like <laughs> cook two different meals all the time. Yeah. So I started eating meat, and I did feel like I had a little bit more energy that way. So for me, it just it it felt better. Um, so I probably just like eased my way back into being a meat eater, and mm-hmm. uh, and yeah, I've stayed that way ever since. So yeah, just clean eating, balance you know, everything in moderation. Um, I'm not on anything strict at all. <laughs> yeah. Consistency, con- moderation and yeah, consistency. Foods, you know? Yeah. Tim, talk about what's probably one of your favorite uh, moments in your career from the standpoint of winning something or a certain drive or a certain event. Like when people ask you about a certain highlight that pops in mind, wh- what would that be? Yeah, that's an easy one for me. Um, in 2013, when I won my first world long drive championship, I was, basically down to my last ball okay. and I was in Vegas at the racetrack speedway, looking at the Vegas strip. It was winner take all everything on the line and I hit it and I just went crazy. That's so cool. What do yeah. you think when you walk up to that? Cause that everyone has, you know, uh, some people are really nervous or think they would be nervous. You, you've obviously been competing for a long time, but is there any thought? Is it all reaction? Is it, is there something that, is there any type of self-talk like, I'm, you know, I'm taking this or this is all me. I got, is there any confidence talk walking up to something like that inside? Yeah. I mean, I try to like think that way all the time, especially like when I'm on, you know, I'm at the venue, you know, try to, you know, I get quiet. I'm like real, I, I get quiet. I mean, Cassandra can tell you, I get quiet and I try to. It's like a different person. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I, I get kind of weird. Um, You're like the guy remember, mean mugging in the corner, huh? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm the guy who's like everybody knows is there, that I, but I don't say anything. Yeah, you know what I mean. Ooh, the quiet assassin. <laughs> so in 2013, <laughs> it was the first live uh, live show on Golf Channel for Long okay. Drive, and I, I do remember being up there and thinking, "All right, this is live. Like, there's no editing. I better square this thing up." 
And I remember I blocked it dead right. I was like, okay, cool. I can do this. And then I just started hitting it down the middle. But that first swing, I was really nervous. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, and that's what, you know, I got to interview Tiger Woods a few years ago and I asked him, and this is probably like a, you know, kind of a funny question, but I had no clue. I'm like, dude, there's so many people on each side of the fairway. Like, and he was like, and his answer back was what people? <laughs> And so it's like to, to, a lot of people that are fans of the sport can't identify with that you, you know, you would be nervous or maybe you get to the point where you're not nervous anymore because it's so normal. I just thought that was an amazing answer because that's literally like was his mindset. He's been doing it since, since he was so young. So Cassandra, what now that you're you're new to the sport relatively with a couple of years, did you have uh, those kind of nervous, you know, on the first the first couple of events, or what kind of stands out to you, where you felt like you settled in and like hit some, you know, some real good balls? Yeah, I think that um, obviously, like my um, semifinal in Atlantic City was my best finish, and um, I had a one and done, and that was like, ooh, I, everything happens so fast in long drive. And I think that for me coming from like sort of the slow, you know, thought out like golf career, it was almost better for me because I could in the past, like really get in my own head and, and not mm -hmm. be as confident as I should have been. And that did stop me from having success um, in some situations. So I think that it was kind of refreshing going into long drive and it was almost like, um, like other sports, you know, where you're more reactionary and you just let your instincts take over because you don't have time to get in your own head. I mean, you do like a little bit beforehand, but then mm -hmm. when that timer's going, it's like, you just go back to what's natural. And I think that that actually like benefited me or, yeah. anyone, like, you know, some insecurities or whatever. Well, yeah, you just have less time to overthink it. I mean, that helps in every situation. That's a reactionary sport. Yeah. It makes sense. Tim, what's kind of, kind of a couple of the cues when you're standing over the ball for you personally? Um, is there do this, do that, you know, waggle that and let's rock or like, what's your, what's your, what's your cues for, for yourself? I mean, for me, uh, I talked to like a sports psychologist a little bit. who's a good friend and he had okay. me doing this, um, thing like where I'd have three different triggers. that would get me in that, like the so, alpha state. Yeah. So for me, you'd always see me behind the ball. Like I'd always visualize a shot. And for me, I visualize a bird for whatever reason. That was just what I okay. when we went through the whole thing. So I visualize like a big Eagle or something. And, and if I do see an actual bird flying, that's even better. Yes. And then the, <laughs> and then the touch would be, uh, I always, t I, like I double tap my, like I have like a tattoo here, my son's birthday. And I'd always like that's double cool. touch that. And then that's my cue and I'll go. I, I would do it every shot in competition. Game on. Love that's it. it. That, so, and, and everyone, most athletes have these little tendencies that maybe They've never shared, they have shared, but it's like, I'm always intrigued by these type of things because that's what triggers, like you said, that alpha mind state or that game on mentality. Cassandra, do you have any uh, cues for yourself? Um, usually mine's just like taking a deep breath, you know, and just kind of <clears throat> trying to slow my heart rate a little bit. Um, you know, when you're like really anxious, oh. you almost feel a little bit shaky and just sort of like trying to yeah. slow down in the moment. Oh yeah, been there. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, I did it sort of adopt. I got it from Eddie Fernandez. Shout out to Eddie. His little like knee kick trigger. And mm -hmm. that actually helped me a lot just to sort of like have a trigger over the ball and not, you know, freeze up while you're over there. It sort of keeps you a little loose. Mine isn't like noticeable. I bet no one could even see it, but it was something that I felt that was just sort of a trigger in my swing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that's about it for me. And yeah, and visualizing, you know, especially in some of our grids, like you have to hit a certain spot and a certain ball flight is, um, you know, more suitable for hitting that so-called like hot spot or whatever. So, um, you know, if you're trying to hit a draw or a fade, you know, visualizing is, is super important, but you know, it's the same as when you're out playing around a golf as well and you're trying to hit a certain pin or. Mm -hmm. Tim, what's kind of the, for people that don't know, I want to go real basic on the equipment. What is the main difference between the club that you're using on TV to hit at 476 and the club that I can go and buy that's um, at the store? Like, what is the main difference that you guys length and shaft? And it just, it'd right. be interesting to hear you kind of break it down. Yeah. So we have the maximum length on the shaft, which is 48 inches. So okay. it is legal on the PGA Tour and okay. USGA conforming now. Uh, before our time, they could use maximum lengths. You'd see guys out there, seventy-inch drivers and stuff. Which I get. I mean, I actually never saw it, but I, everybody tells me about it. 
So that's why we have that whole, you know, stigma of, hey, you know, your driver's not legal and all that. Which, But now it is. It is, yeah. So now okay. it's more of a speed athletic sport. It's not like a skill to time some tree trunk, you know? <laughs> So it's the length and then it's the loft of the drivers, usually much lower. I'm hitting like a three, three and a half degree loft. Gotcha. And most of them are what, like eight or nine? What's the most of the tour? I, I'm not even familiar. Yeah, with tour. Them. I would say eight, eight and the nine range. Okay. okay. Yeah, eight to nine. Yeah, eight or nine probably. Yeah, yeah, I think Bryson's hitting like a six and a half, seven or something. Okay. So yeah, he's kind of bridging the gap between the two worlds a little bit. Yeah, speak on that real quick. Was that exciting to see? Um, that being more displayed towards your sport, really? Because, I mean, when he looks – I saw and I was like, you know, because I weigh like 185, but I've weighed as much as like 240 in my powerlifting days. And I saw him come out and I was like, this is like he went like on the bulk phase and now we've got a powerlifter on tour that has a great swing. It's actually like a great science project that he's proven to be effective. So, you know, speak on that because I, I, it would be cool to hear kind of your take. Is that more exciting for you to watch now or – is it just like going to shed more light on the sport, you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I know he's reached out to a few different long drivers and, you know, picked our brain a little bit. And then watching him out there, just like sending it, you know, it's like he pulls driver out and he has one thing to accomplish and it's swing and hit it. So it's as hard really as cool. he as hard as he can. Literally, the say it looks like you guys. Right. Yeah, I think it, it's going to be really cool. I can't wait to see what he does on six if the wind is correct this week. It's going to be really, really cool to watch. You, you think he'll go for it? Yeah, if it's down, I think it will be down too. I think we're getting a cold front. Actually, Cassandra told me earlier on Saturday. So that that yeah. prevailing wind is going to be straight down on six. Yeah, because like I saw from the T to green. I saw the video that he took. Obviously, couldn't see where the ball went, but the wind was blowing crazy, and it didn't look like the way that you know you guys needed to blow for that to happen. But the fact that if he or when, which will probably happen, does that on TV, people are going to freak out. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> And, I'm and, just if he does miss, I'm curious to see what he does next because yeah. like I, I've missed before, mm -hmm. and then you're like, well, got to reload. <laughs> yeah, and then you're like, well, I know I can make it, so I might as well try to make up for that shot. But you know, it could get ugly quick. I mean, we saw that it's with John the, Daly. <laughs> is the risk reward really worth it on that hole, or is it more of like a statement? I don't think so. To be honest, every time I've actually hit it, like at the flag or on the green or over the green, like right at the pin, it's been a pull. And it's it been a little pull. Is it going to hold anyways? Probably not. <laughs> but I mean, he's a lot better. <laughs> Obviously, he's a professional <laughs> golfer. He's won multiple times. So I'm sure if he hits in the bunker, he's making three. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe two. A couple it, of people have gone for it before, though, haven't they? Hasn't Dustin gone for it? Or is that maybe just in practice rounds that they've posted that I've seen them? I've never, I've, I've never heard that, so I'm not no. sure. Oh, okay, maybe not. Yeah, so that, that's interesting. So as of now, we're not sure whether people have actually went for it during a round. So that could be potentially like a really big deal if Dustin hasn't. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'll have to, I'll have to check that out. Just in practice rounds. That yeah. About it. Yeah, for fun. If he sends it in a real round, it's going to be a wrap, Tim. Don't you think? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be crazy. <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna. Be every everybody's gonna be talking about it all over the place. If he makes it yeah. on the green and makes it two, it's gonna go bananas. What yeah, carry him like three fifty. Okay. I want to say it's like depending on the pen, it's usually like three yeah. fifty six or something. Okay. Yeah, they were saying it was at least three fifty, which is insane. <laughs> <laughs> so, Cassandra, who'd you grow up uh, watching in golf? Who was like your, um, you know, person you looked up to or tried to emulate their game or really like their style? Like who, who did that for you growing up as a kid? Um, I was a big Adam Scott fan. Yeah. I loved his golf swing. It was so good. Smooth. I've always been a big Henrik Stockton fan. Uh, I just love the simplicity of his swing. Um, you know, obviously I grew up in the tiger era. He was never one of my favorites, but mm -hmm. obviously he inspired everyone. Sure. And then when Rory came out, you know, I was a huge fan of him as well. And I met him briefly, um, you know, when I was a little younger and he was just like the nicest guy ever. So, uh, those are probably my, my favorites. And then, you know, I, I obviously like played a lot of golf with a lot of people that are on tour now. So it's, it's fun to, to then see the next generation, um, you know, that I had a little bit more of a connection with kind of take over out there. So sure. Cool. How about you, Tim? Oh, that one guy, Tiger Woods. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, for sure. He, I think he made golf cool. So I probably wouldn't have picked up a golf club if it wasn't for him. 
I think there's a lot of people can say that too, which is wild, right? I mean, he just, he changed the complete sport. Right. Uh, I know one of my favorite people to watch in person is Ernie Els, man. Big yeah. guy, smooth. Big I easy. Love- Oh, big easy. Cause I live in Columbus, Ohio. So we have the Memorial tournament where I live. So a Jack's place that's only about half hour from where I live and, uh, watching Freddie couples. So smooth Ernie mm-hmm. L's obviously tiger too. Um, but you know, being a fitness person, Gary player to me was the one that, you know, really brought obviously fitness to the sport and his energy. He was my first guest on the show. His energy is just unbelievable. So is there any of the like throwback golfers that you guys um, pay attention to? Like, is it over Arnold or, or Jack or Gary? Is there anybody like that that sticks out that are, you know, people you didn't actually grow up watching, but you've watched their film or paid attention to that inspired you guys? Yeah, I played in a pro-am with Lee Trevino. Oh, there you go. And energy, that that guy has some energy. That was that was so much fun. It was it's the most fun I probably ever had in a pro am. So I would definitely say Lee Trevino, and I could tell just how he hit shots, how good he really was. He was like a magician of just shaping, and his short game is still unbelievable. That's so cool. How about you, Cassandra? Yeah, I mean, I definitely um, enjoyed watching Gary Player and just sort of listening to him talk and his like passion behind his work yeah. and all that. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of them are obviously are super inspirational, and just how like prevalent they are in golf still to this day is is pretty cool so tim what's the best course that you've ever walked onto that you'll never forget the round it was unbelievable like what's the highlight of you know Mm. getting to play um at some amazing place Ooh, that's a loaded one. Um, (laughs) you can you you can use a couple if you like i can never (laughs) well i'll never forget the first time i played pebble beach there you go one time because it's usually like hazy and kind of rainy and dark, you know? And for whatever reason, there's only like a few days like this, I guess out there like a year, it was perfect. There mm-hmm. was a cloud in the sky. There was no fog, which now I can appreciate. I played there a few times, but that first time I played there, I was like, this place is unbelievable. I actually couldn't even focus really. I didn't play very well because I'm like <laughs> looking at everything. I'm on the cliff and here's the eels over here. It was, it was crazy. That's there on my sea, list. The sea lion. Sorry. No, I would say that's on my list for sure. Is there another one that's close to it or no? That one, like, I'll always remember. And then the rest are just probably courses like Sage Valley, just because it's so exclusive. You kind of, that that whole vibe in the greens are so quick. And it's just like the fact that, like, I was able to play there, you know, which is rare and stuff like that. I would say, like, Sage Valley's up there. Um, hmm. yeah, I'd say those two. <laughs> those two? All right. Where's Sage Valley at, Tim? It's just uh, it's it's probably thirty minutes north of Augusta National. Okay, so it's so it's actually in South Carolina, but it's like on the border. Okay, gotcha. I've never heard of that. I'm gonna check that out. Cassandra, how about you? Um, like golf course wise, yeah. I played Whistling Straits this summer, and that was Ooh, that's amazing. a good one too. Yeah, it was really awesome. Um, like just blew my expectations out of the water for sure. So that was probably my best like golf course memory. That's cool. I got to, uh, I was on uh, a trip to Scotland, not to actually play golf, but was there uh, with the intention to play St. Andrews. And I got a chance to, uh, as single player, they don't, you can't like book ahead of time, but you can wait in line. So I got to the, uh, the caddy or the tea starter um, shed at like 10 PM the night before slept on the concrete no way. Yep. By the time 3 a.m. hit, I right there. there was 60 people in line. I was number seven, getting there the night before, slept on my backpack. My wife stayed across the street in one of the hotels right there, right there on uh, 18. And uh, the guy comes in in the morning. He goes, at 6 a.m., he goes, uh, we have seven spots today. And I was number seven. Good I got for so you. lucky. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm a, a bogey golfer, but I had a really good round, had a great caddy. I had a, a birdie putt on 18, not playing from the back tees, from the middle tees, a birdie putt on 18 to break 90, and I missed it. <laughs> but it was um, un, an unbelievable experience because we were on hole number, I want to say like, 15 or something and he looked the caddy had been there 20 years he was smoking non-filtered cigarettes i mean he was serious and he looked at me he goes kings used to play golf here 
Like it was like one of those like experiences where you just never would forget it. So I always like to ask that question because I think there's going to be fans that watch us and say, you know what? I really got to get to Pebble Beach or Whistling Straits or take the trip to Scotland. You know, it, it's it's an it's amazing part of golf that bites all of us. So to go have those experiences. All right. So what's what's next for you, Cassandra, right now? What are you training for? What are you excited for? Uh, what's coming up event wise? What's kind of on your plate? Event wise, not a whole lot. Um, you know, we're sort of in limbo with the world long drive um, as a sport. So okay. um, there's a couple of smaller <clears throat> tours starting up, <clears throat> but they're not quite yet worth it for the women to show mm -hmm. up because and I know that sounds bad, but it's just so expensive. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that it something big happens with it soon so that, you know, we can get back to competing on a regular basis. Cause you know, I just had that little like teaser year and I loved it so much. It was awesome. And I felt like, um, you know, I kind of found where I fit in again. And so I'm really, you know, hopeful for it to make a little bit of a comeback. Um, you know, obviously we had a rough year with COVID and stuff. Sure. Um, but other than outside of that, uh, you know, I'm working on my regular game. I don't really have any plans to compete again, but just sort of enjoying playing golf. And then, you know, obviously, like we talked about earlier, just doing starting up a fitness program and um, getting a little bit more involved with with that side of it as well. That's cool. Tim, do you have anything on the calendar right now or is there nothing for the calendar currently? Well, I have I actually with COVID and everything, and when there was nothing, I got into a med device. So I've been doing selling total joints. So I'm in the OR right. a lot working. So doing like total knees, hips, shoulder replacements. Um, I actually just competed with some of the guys like Kyle, who beat me at the world championship in 19, and Justin James, and mm -hmm. some of the faster guys. And I had no, really no expectation. And then when I got out there, I was moving it. So I'm like, all right, all right, I right still in. got it. All right, so <laughs> now, now I've got a little. You know, I'm pretty happy because even when I won the two world championships, I had a full time job. So I'm inspired again a little bit and I'm just hoping to have some bigger events because it's really important for us to be competing on TV without TV. It's oh. sport can't really grow. So, yeah, I mean, I would say that that's hard to click off of whenever it's on TV. I get sucked in every time. I mean, it's it's so like you said, the fast paced nature of it, obviously being a weightlifter. I'm like, this is, my, you know, I, I love the intensity of it. Um, so yeah, I think that TV is, is huge for everything, but for this sport specifically, you guys need, you have to, and the crowd, the crowd, although I know they're not huge crowds usually, but they seem pretty rowdy, right? Does it pretty fun to, yeah, to be at some of those? It's awesome yeah. person. Like I wish that, you know, more people would, would try to get to an event just to like see what it's like. And mm -hmm. at, in our event in Rochester, uh, I guess it's two years ago now. Um, we had a huge crowd and, you know, just people had so much fun and it is like, it's just a lot of energy and it's loud and it's fun. You know, it's like the extreme sport of golf. And so I think that like, if people, um, if we got more people involved in the events in person, I think it could get really big, you know, cause it's kind of like the waste management whole, like it's exactly sort of environment, you know what I mean? And people love that. I think they just don't realize that they have the opportunity to experience that with long drive. Waste yeah, management. That's what I was going to say. We should do it like the Wednesday after yes. the program. Yeah. Yes. That'd they they need, they need to have a nighttime waste management long drive and people would be drinking so much beer and having so much fun. And that would be amazing for you. I would start, I'd start tweeting them now, Tim, let them know. That'd be, yeah, that'd be amazing. <laughs> I've been saying that forever. I mean, a lot of us have, we yeah. got to find a way to make that happen because the atmosphere is there. All you got to do is build oh. the stage. Yeah, they, they they that's not a stretch at all. Yeah, nobody wants to leave the grounds anybody, and everybody's yeah. pretty popped at the end of the day, anyways. So For like, sure, watch these guys send it. Yeah, no, that's uh that's an amazing it, idea. I would not right give up it. on that. Oh, yeah, that would be really cool if some of the tour players jumped in too. Yeah, like Bryson, I think definitely would. I mean, he might compete just for fun, like after his season if he has a break in one of yeah. those smaller events. I mean, he loves it. That right there would change the game if somebody that's a major champion has the kahoot it's almost like the dunk contest sometimes like the guys like lebron don't really compete in the dunk contest and they're kind of like come on lebron like but i mean for this if bryson would cross over because they're putting themselves out there to get beat by you know someone that's a specialist in that area that takes you know some kahunis to do that and you know that would be amazing if bryson did that i think for the sport yeah i mean i think if bryson trains for it he could be like competitive for sure so it's not like a tour guy coming out that's been the longest on tour, swinging 128 or whatever 
you know, like that's different. Yeah, I, I would say, but like Bryson could, could, could like compete, but even the other longer guys on tour, I'm sure, even if you could team us up together, yeah, or something, yeah. because That'd they be don't cool. expect to beat us. I mean, yeah. I hope not. You know what I mean? Like it's that's like me saying I'm gonna go beat you in golf. Like, yeah, but the combined no some type of combined like you know with the yeah. team total like thousand yards. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Love the idea. But Love the idea. The Cameron Champ and like Tony could, you know, they like really gave it their all. Like they could, they can put it out there too, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Tony's fast. Be, he went like two, yeah, over 200. Like, like exhibition type thing, you know? That's cool. Well, I want to be respectful of your time, guys. So I'm going to get you out of here. Uh, Cassandra, where can they find you on social media? Cass Marie underscore B. Okay. All social media platforms. Yes, I'm mostly just on Instagram, but okay. I do have a Twitter account. I don't think I've ever posted anything. <laughs> I've never <laughs> actually tweeted. But okay, well, <laughs> that's maybe a goal here soon. Go ahead and get a tweet out there. <laughs> yeah. Tim, Tim, where can everybody find you at? Uh, mine's just Tim Burke Golf. Okay, on all uh, all platforms, also. Yes, sir. Cool. Well, I appreciate the time. Uh, this is the Golf and Fitness Show. I'm your host Corey Gregory. That's Cassandra. That's Tim, and we are out. <laughs>